Okay, good morning, everyone. This is session four of our races course. So we're now halfway through the course. Um, today is about uh, the outcomes. And uh, I'm very pleased that uh, today, Ms. L is going to co-run co the session with me. So I just want to uh, thank uh, Ms. L for, for doing this. Uh, as always, the session will be recorded. Uh, we will make it available on the YouTube channel for the ARC Noves Coast. But if you have any questions about the recordings, do let us know. Okay. Here we go. So just to start, I want to ask you if you have any questions about the homework uh, uh, from the last session, which was about the cost data. So any quick questions we might be able to address now, feel free to let us know. I know many of you uh, managed to complete the homework. If you are waiting for feedback, just let us know, and you know we are uh, we are more than happy to have a look at your homework and uh, you know provide feedback on that. So if you want to write on the chat that you're waiting for feedback, just let us know, of course. Um, okay. So today's session is about outcomes. So we are completing the methods part of the economic ev evaluation uh, and. Um, from next session, we will talk more about the results. But before we move to the actual session, I want to talk about the workshop. And I sent an email last week, and I want to thank uh, those who replied to me about the workshop. But if you can let me know if you are able to attend the fa face to face, if you are able to be there in person at the workshop in September, that would be great. We are trying to get an idea of numbers and uh, just to make sure we can secure a, a room at the hotel in Kendall. So, you know, if you want to write on the chat today, I'm, I'm able to come, uh, or if you want to write me an email, uh, that would be great. And by the end of the week, uh, yeah, we need to have an idea on numbers, that's great. People who already replied to me, you know, that's fine. You don't need to uh, write to me again. And thanks for doing that. Ah, uh, Pat, okay, I've seen your message about the homework, that's great. So, uh, uh, I think Andy will uh, will uh, will be able to have a look at your homework. Yeah. Um, okay. So, just move to uh, this slide, which, as you as you know, is about the different section of the commentary. So today is about the outcome data, and then session five we'll talk more about the results and the analysis, and then session six is about the introduction. We have we'll also have some Q and A for any questions you might have. And as I was mentioning a few seconds ago, the last uh, bit is the co is the commentary which we will uh, address at the workshop in Handel. So a quick overview of today's session. The aim is to identify and describe the characteristics of the outcome data and the type of discounting used in economic evaluation. We will talk about a few things today. First of all, I will uh, talk about the cost effectiveness plane. Then Ms. L has a very good examples about cost-effectiveness decision that we'll uh, uh, talk through. Then I will talk about clinical effectiveness outcomes for cost-effectiveness analysis and cost-consequence analysis. And then Ms. L will talk more about composite outcomes for cost-utility analysis. And then I will uh, conclude today's session uh, uh, talking about discounting uh, uh, very quickly. Now, this is a, a slide I'm sure you will be bored of uh, by now. So it's the typical slide where we're trying to describe what, what's going on in economic population and just uh, to give you a sense uh, where we are at today, we are talking about the consequences, so the outcomes, the, the effects from the different interventions that uh, the authors are comparing in the economic evaluation. And I'm going to now try to describe how you know, costs and consequences or costs and effects are considered together. And I'm going to present you with this uh, figure, which is the cost effectiveness plane. You, you will have heard in past sessions that uh, I, I, I mentioned a couple of times how it's important to consider costs and effects in a joint way rather than in isolation. And with this plane, with this cost effectiveness plane, I will try to describe a, a bit more in depth what I mean with that. So, for those of you who don't like graphs so much, so, you know, planes and maths, uh, I will try to go really step by step in, in, in describing what's going on within this plane. So bear with me. Uh, we'll, we'll start with the 
two axes. So the two blue axes, the vertical axis and the, and the horizontal axis, first of all. The vertical axis is all about costs. So, for example, if you are on the top side of the vertical axis, that means the new treatment is more expensive or more costly than the, than the existing treatment, which could be usual care, for example. Instead, if you are in the bottom side, that means the new treatment is less costly. So it's cheaper than the existing treatment, okay? So there is this split between the top and bottom uh, for the vertical axis. Let's have a look at the horizontal axis now. Here we are taking into consideration the effects of the intervention. So how good the interventions are, whether they improve uh, the quality of life of the individuals uh, and how they compare in terms of improving the quality of life of the individuals. So on the right hand side, the new treatment is more effective than the existing treatment. That means that uh, it will produce, let's say, more health gains than the existing treatment for the, for the people who are receiving that particular uh, intervention or treatment. So it's doing better, let's say, in, in terms of improving quality of life uh, for people. On the left-hand side, instead, the new treatment is less effective. So that means the existing treatment is doing better in terms of improving quality of life uh, for people. Okay, so you, you, you got this split again between the right and left-hand side in this case. So you got these four combinations now, which are described by the different quadrants, by the different parts in this plane. And I'm going to um, assess this, each quadrant uh, one by one now. And I'm, I'm going to consider the costs and the outcome side together. And I'm gonna explain what the consequences are of uh, considering cost and outcomes uh, uh, together for each quadrant. So let's start with the northwest quadrant, which is at uh, the top uh, left hand side of the plane. In this quadrant, the new treatment is more expensive, more costly, but it's also less effective. So that means that the existing treatment is cheaper and is more effective. And the existing treatment will dominate the new treatment. So it will be quite straightforward to decide that uh, is. Uh, good uh, uh, way to invest our money, to, to put our money into the existing treatment, basically, because the new treatment is more expensive and is also less effective. So this is quite straightforward. Another straightforward situation is, the, is in the southeast quadrant, where instead the new treatment is more effective and is also cheaper, is also less costly than the existing treatment. In this case, the new treatment dominates the existing treatment. So again, uh, is a is a quite clear situation where, you know, the new treatment is doing better, uh, we, uh, it's cheaper, so we don't need to invest as much money as we would with the existing treatment. So it's a clear situation where the new treatment dominates the existing treatment. Instead, things get a bit trickier when we consider the other two quadrants. So I'll start with the southwest quadrant so we are on the bottom left hand side of the plane now in this case the new treatment is less costly so it's cheaper but it's also less effective so you got this trade-off now between uh, saving money but also not producing as many health gains as the existing treatment right and this is quite a, a tricky situation and whoever needs to decide about the investing uh, money in the new treatment or not, uh, we need to take into account whether it's morally acceptable, even politically acceptable to forego some health gains for the sake of saving some money, for example. So this is a bit tricky. Another tricky situation is on the Northeast quadrant where the new treatment is more effective, but it's also more costly. So it's more expensive. And this is a very, very common situation because if you think about new technologies, uh, new drugs, uh, a new type of surgery, or a, a new diagnostic tool that uh, we are considering for implementation, that usually requires more expensive uh, training up health or social care professionals. So that requires more, more costs. But at the same time, there is some promise that the new treatment might be more effective. So again, you got a trade-off between effectiveness and costs. And we need to consider whether 
the new treatment is value for money. So we, whether we are happy to invest more money in order to get more health gains. Okay. So there, there are some budget considerations here which we need to take into account. All this, anyway, it's just to say, you know, typically we are going to be in that northeast quadrant, but of course there are situations where we have uh, uh, the existing treatment dominating the new treatment uh, or vice versa, or we can even fall in the southwest, southwest quadrant as well. Right. So I'm just going to stop sharing for now, and I'm going to leave the presentation to uh, Misael. Here we go. Misael. OK, thank you. So we'll dip a bit in this example of the cost effectiveness decisions. So let's suppose that there are two new cancer drugs available in the market that can be purchased and financed. And drug A can extend life by one year and cost 100 pounds, whereas drug B can extend life also by one year, but is more costly. So here, which one to choose? I think it is very clear that we will choose the first drug is, is, is easy to see this because drug A can produce the same extra year of life using fewer resources than drug B. And then we cannot waste 200 pounds financing drug B because it's, it's extending the same year of life. So there is no sense of, of financing drug B. But what about if, and this is the, the the, the example that Valerio is, is talking about, that drug B can extend life by two years, but it's more costly. So how we can uh, decide which one to choose? Because now drug A is extended, is extending only one year, drug B is extending two years, but drug B is more costly. Then here we need this concept of net benefit, which is done additional years of life compared with the, about the, with the overall NHS. Now, let's suppose that the NHS overall in the whole system can produce one additional year of life with 50 pounds. This is called the opportunity cost. Then the net benefit estimation is as follows. Uh, for, for track A, at pace of 100, drug A can extend one year of life. So that is straightforward. But with the same 100, the NHS can produce two years of life. And this is because the NHS can produce one year of life with 50 pounds. So with 100 pounds, it will produce two years of life. Which means that, that the NHS will lose everywhere two years of life because currently is, is, is producing two years of life with 100, to gain only one additional year of life with Jack B, which is minus one year of life. And then for Jack B, at place of 300, Jack B can produce two years of life. But with the same 300 pounds, the NHS can produce six years of life. It's 300. Uh, between 50 pounds. So then the NHS will lose el elsewhere six years of life to finance drug B, which will produce two years of life only, which means minus five years of life. Which one to choose? The answer is none of them. None of them because uh, both drugs will generate additional year of life, but will require to forego more years of life in the whole system. And now, and now, taking a bit more interesting, let's say that the NHS can produce one additional year of life with 100 pounds. Now the opportunity cost is not 50 pounds, but it's 100 pounds. With the same exercise, we will find that Again, with, with, uh, 100, with 100 pounds, drug A can extend one year of life, but now the NHS also 
is producing one gear of light with 100 pounds, which means drag A is indifferent. So we can finance that or not, it's the same. Whereas for drag B, still we were reducing because uh, with 300 pounds, the NHS can produce three years of life. And here we are only going to gain two years of life, which is minus one years of life. Interestingly, if the NHS can produce one year of life with 101 pounds, then financing drug A is cost effective. Because now it's not indifferent, because now it's, uh, is 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 more is uh is the system is giving up giving up uh, more years of life than producing now. So drug A is cheaper than the overall system. We can say it like that. Okay. Now, following this example, let's say the the NHS overall system now produce one year of life with two hundred pounds. Doing all the maths, we will find that both of them are indifferent. But if the NHS can produce one year of life at 201 pounds, then drug B will be the drug that will be cost effective. We can summarize this in this uh, line. Uh, if the cost opportunity of producing one year of life for the NHS is less than 100, we cannot choose any of these drugs. Because drug e, A and B uh, will reduce years of life regardless to the whole system. If this opportunity cost is between 100 and 200, then drug A will be cost effective. Above 200, drug B will be cost effective. So this, the cost that we, the NHS is producing one addi additional year of life is also known as the opportunity cost, as, as we are explaining, or the cost effectiveness threshold. So this is just to, to, to put an example of how we can decide, how can we decide between drugs. And this will depend on the NHS threshold. We will explain later, of course. Over to you, Valerio. Oh, thank you, Misael. Um, do you have any questions so far? Just one note, I think there was a yeah. typo in, in uh, the, the last example, because it said drug A was indifferent to NHS, and I think drug A in that case was selected, and then the drug B was indifferent. But just a typo. Okay, we will check that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we'll correct that. Oh, thank you, Luis. Um, any questions from people? Okay, I'm gonna reshare my slides then. Here we go. Okay, here we go. So, what what we try to do now is. You know, try to give you some understanding that, uh, you know, health economics is not only about cost savings, but we, we need to consider the outcomes. So um, with MISALA examples, uh, you, you've seen this, you've seen that uh, you, you, we have a consideration of the cost, uh, the outcome side, the cost effective threshold, which uh, we're going to cover uh, later on. But it is important that we got this understanding. It is a joint analysis. It's not only just about saving money. It's also making good use of the money we have in the NHS so in our health or social care system. Um, here you got uh, this uh, list of different uh, types of economic evaluation, which uh, you already saw in uh, session two. And I'm going to focus now on the fourth column, which is all about the measurement evaluation of consequences or effects. And in particular, I want to cover uh, the cost consequence analysis and the cost effectiveness analysis because they both uh, uh, take into account effects uh, using a, a natural unit, uh, things like life years gain, disability they saved, uh, points of blood pressure reduction. So I'm going to talk about these type of outcomes in a minute. 
And then with MISEL, we'll cover the cost utility analysis later on, which is attached to a more composite outcome, uh, which is healthy years instead. So let's start with the clinical effectiveness outcomes. So these are things I'm sure you're familiar with, and I'm gonna provide you with some examples, uh, some examples in a minute. What we need to remember, these are outcomes which apply to cost effectiveness analysis and cost consequences analysis. And they literally measure how good the interventions are. So whether the intervention are effective in improving uh, a certain uh, 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 condition for a, a specific population, as if, if they are good at improving the quality of life generally for, for people receiving the interventions. In a cost consequences analysis, we usually have a list of clinical and process outcomes. Um, so they might things related, for example, to physical health, the mental health of the individuals related to uh, receiving the intervention, sorry, but also things related to how uh, the health of the social care professionals uh, accept the particular intervention, whether they're able to deliver the intervention in an appropriate way, whether the patients are able to receive it in a way that makes sense or is it, is it acceptable to them. So there are a lot of clinical process outcomes considered usually in a cost consequence analysis, and they're listed in a disaggregated way, like in a separate way. And then it's up to decision maker to assess the relative importance of all these outcomes. In a cost effectiveness analysis, instead, uh, there is usually a selection of key clinical outcomes uh, where the analysis is going to focus on. And if you read a study, you might have seen this term like primary outcome measure, for example, which is distinguished from secondary outcome measures. And typically a cost effectiveness analysis will focus on one or more primary outcome measures uh, which are uh, being assessed in a study. So cost, cost consequence analysis, a list of clinical and process outcomes all separate. Instead, in a cost effectiveness analysis, we are trying to calculate a cost per additional gain in health. So again, a joint analysis of cost and health gains together. Some examples here. So typically or ideally, you would like to measure outcomes which are long-term outcomes, for example, cost per life year gained, as Misel uh, was describing with his, with the, his examples before, but also things like cost for improvement in quality of life. Okay? Now, this is ideal, but it's not always possible. It might be prohibitive to follow up people for such a long time. And uh, what happens uh, more often than not is we have to uh, we have to measure surrogate outcomes. For example, uh, cost per one point reduction in blood pressure, cost per uh, one kilo of weight loss uh, or malignant, uh, malignant cancer detected, additional vaccination, avoided hospitalization and tests and so on. So these are, these are all things that might be, let's say beneficial in the short term, but they might not measure whether people are actually have a, a prolonged benefit in the long term as a consequence of receiving the intervention. So, of course, receiving, for example, a vaccination is a, be is a beneficial thing in the short term, but that might not necessarily mean that people are avoiding catching viruses uh, for sure, 100%, right? The same for avoided hospitalization might be a good thing, might also might not be such a good thing because people might not... Uh, attend uh, important visits. It might be cost-saving for the NHS, so, of course. So th these are all surrogate outcomes which we have to use because it is often unfeasible to follow up people for, for a long term in the future. So we are able instead to capture things which might be more short term and which are giving us an indication of the, the health of people in the, in the short term. With composite outcomes instead, we are now moving to cost utility analysis. Uh, with composite outcomes, we are really talking about this concept of healthy years. Healthy years uh, is a, really a combination of quality of life and life expectancy. So we are considering the quantity and the quality together. The concept of, co of healthy years is uh, linked to the quality adjusted life years or qualis. 
and I'm sure uh, some of you will have heard of this concept before. Um, cost utility analysis typically aim to, cal to calculate the cost per additional quality. So with the cost effectiveness analysis, we had a cost per additional gain in health. Here we got a cost per additional quality or per additional quality adjusted life here. Now, we are going to cover uh, uh, qualities a bit a bit in depth now, uh, especially with Misael in, in a minute. Uh, qualities are, re are really common and uh, they are widely used in economic evaluations. Uh, they're recommended by the National Institute for Healthcare Excellence. Many economic valuations will consider qualities. Um, so even if your paper, uh, which you're assessing right now, doesn't consider qualities, I'm sure that in future, if you read another paper uh, about an economic valuation, you will see qualities. So it, it's, it'd be good uh, to familiarize yourself with what the qualities are and how we measure them. The qualities are so widely used because they are they are kind of a common metric which can be apply, uh, applied to different health or disease areas. So what I mean with common metric, if you think about the concept of healthy years, so how well I'm living, how also long I'm living uh, as a consequence of receiving an intervention. This concept can be applied to different health or disease areas. So whether I'm uh, a stroke survivor, whether I'm, I'm in a smoking cessation therapy, whether I have diabetes, the cost of health years is applicable to all these different health or disease areas. The examples I was showing you before, like uh, a point reduction in blood pressure, uh, additional vaccination, they are relevant for their own specific health areas. Like for example, blood pressure will be relevant for hypertension interventions, but they might not be so relevant for other health or disease areas. Instead, with healthy years, with qualities, we got this common metric which can be applied and can be compared across different health or disease areas. And that is really useful from a resource allocation point of view. So if we are, we are able to identify the additional qualities we will gain from an intervention in stroke, the additional qualities we will gain from an intervention in diabetes, and so on and so on and so on. Another important quality of qualities is that they are based on preference or utility, which is a very, very, very important concept in economics. Um, so with qualities, uh, we are not only trying to understand uh, or to describe the health status of patients or individuals. We want also to know the value that individuals place on their particular health state. Economics, uh, economic theories are often based on maximizing personal utility or the utility for uh, a community or society, given a particular constraint, like a budget, for example. In the same way, we are going to a supermarket uh, and we want to buy a certain uh, food or a certain drink because that food or drink maximizes our utility. Of course, uh, we need to consider that uh, buying that particular food or drink uh, needs to be uh, needs to be weighed against our particular budget, which is how much money we got in our wallet. So there is always this trade-off between maximizing our utility given the particular budget we have. The same for an health or social care system. We're trying to maximize the welfare for the society given the resources we got available. So utilities are very important and with qualities, uh, we are able to attach utilities or preferences to specific health states. Um, I think now, okay, I've got another slide before I, uh, I leave the presentation to Ms. L. So this is just an example which we, uh, we already saw uh, in, a, in a previous session. So we got the paper, we have been used as an example um, where we are, we are uh, really uh, identifying what the authors use in terms of outcomes. In this case, they use life years and quality adjusted life year. So we got a kind of clinical outcome and then a, a composite outcome. And this is how we extracted that type of information in our RACI. So just a sentence describing that the authors, uh, uh, they, they, they try to determine the average cost, the life years and the quality adjusted life years or qualities per patient for, for both comparators. So this is just to uh, 
just to give you a, a very quick example now to extract and write up the info about the outcomes for a paper from a paper. But now I'm going to stop sharing and uh, yeah, over to you, Misa. Thank you. Let's see now how the quality adjusted life years are estimated. So as uh, as little explained, quality adjusted life years is a composite measure that combines years of life and quality of life. And this quality of life is a value, is an estimation that goes from zero, death, to one, perfect health. And there are steps of estimating this quality uh, adjusted years of life. So there is a, a questionnaire, which is usually the heritage quality of life questionnaire, usually the DECO5D, which is embedded in many RCTs. And then it comes this utility scores that Barry was talking about, which is a weighted uh, estimation from the general population. And then finally, we got this uh, quality, of, quality of adjusted life year, which is a combination of these weighted uh, estimations times the years, additional years of life that is given a specific intervention. So first, let's go to the uh, to, to this questionnaire. So usually this EQ5D has uh, five dimensions, this 5D, five dimensions, and has three or uh, five levels. The dimensions are as follows. First is mobility, second is self-care, then usual activity, followed by pain and discomfort and anxiety and depression. So this, this has five dimensions and the levels are three levels with no problems, some problems and unable or extreme problems, which is these three levels or five levels, which is no problems, slight problems, moderate, several and unable. And then we will assign this a value from zero to one, but let, let's, let's go step by step. Here we have an example of this questionnaire so for, for mobility. The questionnaire is, is as follows. It says, under each heading, please tick one box that best describes your health today. And the EQ5D three levels, we will give in three options. In mobility, I have no problems in walking about. I have some problems in walking about and I am confined to bed. So depends of, of, the, of the state, the, the individual will take one of these three, three options. And in the five level version, we will have five options that goes from, I have no problems working about, which is the same, but then they will be disaggregated a bit, okay? I have a slight problems in walking about, I have moderate problems in walking about, I have severe, severe problems walking about, and I am un unable to walk about. We have three against five levels. In the EQ5D three levels, we will have 243 health states, which is the combination of all, all of the questionnaires, which are all the options. Whereas in the EQ5D five level, we will have 3,125 health states. Then after each person, each uh, patient or each individual, which is in the RCT will answer these questions, then this will be mapped for the values, which, which is, which is, uh, which is, co which come from the, from a survey from the general population. So this is, this comes from this study, which was, was published in 2008. And this is a table with, for the five level questionnaire in England. Which is interesting in this uh, it is how people are valuing the reduction of their utility for each state. For example, if we see the worst state in each of categories, for example, mobility, unable, this 0 uh, 0.274 means 0.74 less utility than health, than full health. 
And then again, if we put that in the self-care enable and usual activity the awards and pain and discomfort awards and anxiety and depression the awards, then we will have uh, a, an utility which is minus dot two eight five less than uh, that. Actually, about five percent of health state is already related worse, worse than that. About five percent of this uh, over more than three thousand uh, combinations are worse than that. And then we have here how we are valuing this. For example, which one is the which state health status is uh, reducing utilities more? And this comes from pain and discomfort. If we see here pain and discomfort extreme is 0 0.335, uh, which reflect the value of the general population of pain and discomfort. Uh, I can live with a slight pain and discomfort, but if I have extreme pain and discomfort, this gives us a lot of utility. Contrary of that, we the the, the, the health status that is reducing less utility is anxiety and depression, but only if that is slightly. Okay. But this is then uh, how we map. This is from the general population. It's a random uh, sample. It's a representative sample from the general population, and they are asked to answer questions. And there is a discrete choice experiment. Now this is the results. Now, after the EQ5D, we will map this with this utility. How we do that, for example, with, with, one, with one example? Let's say we have the utility value of hell 2, 3, 2, 5, 4, 5, which means for mobility is slightly, for the other state is 3, and so on. For the last one, for anxiety and depression, is the worst, it's 5. Okay? So, one is full head. This two, which is which comes from here, is minus zero dot zero five eight. If we go back, you can check this value here. Okay, and then we reduce this zero dot zero five eight, and for this is for mobility, which comes from the slight problems. And then we will reduce a 0.08 from self-care, which is moderate problems. And then we will reduce a further 0.05, which comes from user activities, level two, the slight problems, and then minus 0.276, which comes from pain and discomfort, level four, severe problems, and anxiety and depression, which is the highest level. And then the result will be 0 .2, uh, sorry, 0 0.247. This will be the utility value for this hell state. Remember, 0 is dead and 1 is full health. And here is a quarter of that, okay? a quarter of that. So, one year extra will only value a quarter of full health. This is what, what this example means. And then, this is a nice graph just to check graphically uh, the interventions. For example, we will have uh, a state without intervention, without treatment, which is this line. We can see that the time of the time of death is lower, less than the, the treatment B. Okay. And the quality rate of life, the quality is reducing over time. With treatment instead, we will extend life and also we will extend, we will reduce discomfort, we will reduce how people feel problems, that this will extend this quality of life. 
then this area between these two curves will be the qualis gained from the treatment. Okay, over to you, Valerio. Here we are. Oh, thank you, Michel. Any questions? Let's see the chat. Okay. So I'll carry on. I'll share my slides. Okay. Okay. Uh, we got a question from Maria. Sorry. Uh, where does the value set come from? Um, so as Miel was saying, um, there are surveys which are done with the random sample from the general population uh, uh, quite regularly, say quite frequently. And uh, the general population is asked about uh, giving values to these different combination of L states. So for the Q5D 5L, the last one was done, I think in 2018, if I remember well, um, for the Q5D 3L that was done a bit, a bit before that. So yeah, for the UK, these are the studies uh, uh, where uh, the value set uh, uh, value sets come from, and of course, in, internationally there are studies done in other countries as well, uh, where other researchers have tried to determine the value set for their own specific uh, uh, population. Let's say, Valerio, fo following yeah. that, why not uh, just a sample for for patients? Why for the general <laughs> population? Yeah, this is a good question, and uh, I often uh, I often try to consider with people why why we are asking the general population uh, to value the health states, and why we are not asking the patients, like Misael was suggesting here. Does anyone have got any idea? Why we bother about asking the general population, which are uh, Maybe, maybe they maybe they yeah. feel less problems, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Maybe they are healthier than the patients, and instead yeah. the patients are feeling that condition, they're feeling the that particular disease. So why we are not asking the patients directly? I suppose if the sample size is restricted just to the patients, then there's potential for bias because you're asking those who are affected. Whereas I assume it would be better to have a, a a wider context, a, a wider range of response. That's a very good point, Will. Uh, uh, thank you. And uh, uh, the, yeah, there is that risk. Absolutely. There is also evidence that says that people living in that particular condition tend to value their health state a bit better than the general population because the general population tend to catastrophize a bit, uh, uh, you know, the the description of an health state and tend to maybe, uh, yeah put less value or smaller value to a particular state. So that's a really good point. Yeah, the, there is the risk of that people might game the system in a way, yeah. I think well, it's my... also because people adapt. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think uh, several times you just get a disease and, and you do have your quality of life severely decreased, but then you adapt and then you, you, you tend to rebound a little bit. And, yes. and I think the general population only counts uh, the shock, but then doesn't count the rebound. Marie has, is, is asking in the, in the chat, does it yeah. have to do something with who is paying taxes? Yeah, that's <laughs> the main reason, Maria. That's, <laughs> that's really the main reason. It's a bit, uh, I say cynical, but I don't know. But it's, it really, it's really down to that. Uh, so we are all taxpayers. So we are kind of... Uh, eligible to have a say in the process. So that's why uh, they're asking the general population to express their views on, on the on the, on the health states, yeah. Uh, Hilary. Yeah, I, I was actually going to say something similar and the mm. fact that it's a, a societal and cultural um, measure as well of what a society is prepared to, how, how a society is prepared to describe at the health state and the, and the value of health state. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it goes down to maximizing the welfare for the society and uh, given this, the society budget. So yeah, it's, it goes down to that kind of collective decision we, we're trying to, to achieve at determining. Yeah. Will. Thank you. Just wondering, I suppose, taking that forwards, um, it, it, if we are surveying the whole population because 
we and the majority pay tax. Does that change, therefore, if we move to another country where um, the health system is funded in a different way? So using the states as an example. Yeah, that that will, that, that that could change, and uh, of course, uh, other people might want to come in. Uh, you know, Luis uh, and them is. Uh, I think that the foundations of the the mechanism will change like, in a way because we're not talking about uh, you know having a general collective decision where uh, we are all contributing for the healthcare system or the social care system. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm 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 assuming not not, not such a big answer on other countries, but I'm assuming the yeah the condition will change so we will have to think about other mechanisms there yeah but it is an advantage to ask anyway yeah. that the society because we can we can value how the society as a whole is value health mm. so we can decide overall maximizing society's uh, utility society's benefits yeah, yeah. It has, I think, some drawbacks in, the, in this kind. But yeah. overall, I think the asking the aware population is, is a sensible way to do, to go. I, you always generate a lot of the debate at this, uh, this point. Uh, I can see that. Uh, Luis, you wanted to say something? Uh, just to note, I don't know how, how you are in terms of time, but um, the, the, the first question from Maria, where does the value set come from? Uh, is that also a question about how they are computed, uh, the, um, the scores? Because uh, Michelle said it uh, very fast, right? That it is uh, uh, with discrete choice experiments. But I, I don't know if it would be worth just to explain more or less how how that works. Is it still, or, or is sometimes just time trade off? Or how are they doing? Yeah, they that, are... that that is a genuine question. I don't know exactly yeah. how they are doing right now. How they are doing it? I'll tell you what. Uh, uh, we'll finish our slide and I will talk about okay. it. Uh, if people are interested in it, we, we'll spend five minutes maybe after to talk about it, the different techniques. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Yeah. Okay, I'll reshare my presentation. Uh, here we go. Okay, so. This is a slide summarizing the main criticism of the qualis. Like we are talking about the qualis a lot in this session, and that doesn't necessarily mean we like it hundred uh, percent. You know, there are some criticism attached to the qualis which are uh, I've emerged in the, in the literature, and I'm trying to summarize them here. First of all, uh, I'm I'm going to talk uh, about equity concerns. So there is this a strong assumption when we use the qualis that the quali is a quali regardless of who gains and who loses. So. Am I um, receiving an intervention? Uh, I will obtain, let's say, I don't know, three qualities out of that intervention, but the qualities don't consider whether I am from a, a deprived area or not. I am living in a remote area with uh, uh, not a, a great deal of access to health or social care services. Uh, it doesn't consider whether my uh, health is already above the average population health or below the average population health. It doesn't really consider to great extent my medical history. So a quality is a bit uh, irrespective of all that, right? So there are equity concerns which uh, will uh, will be uh, uh, will be emerging uh, on the back of using qualis. And there's also the thing about the qualis placing different values on different people. The, the, the Probably the most straightforward example is that with elderly uh, uh, people, which, uh, of course, their life expectancy compared with younger people might not be so uh, great. So that means that when we're using qualities, which are based on improving quality of life, improving life expectancy, there is less room for improvement, let's say, in the elderly strata of the population compared with the younger strata of the population, all right? Another point about the qualities, which uh, is... Uh, is a source of criticisms whether they capture all relevant aspects. And this is more to do with AQ5D rather than the quality. So this is more to do with the instruments uh, we use to generate the qualities. If you remember, the AQ5D is based on dimensions, uh, five dimensions, and they're not going to cover each uh, specific uh, nuance of how a person function or feels uh, uh, after receiving an intervention. So there are things like, for example, process of care, which is sometimes as important as the outcome of care. So whether people, for example, are happy to use a certain technology, uh, an app, for example, uh, whether an intervention is actually feasible uh, 
within that care system or the, the social care system. So that these are all in, uh, components uh, um, and elements that are important and the qualis or the EQ5D won't capture them. In the same way, we have a lot of disease-specific outcome measures which really examine, for example, how a person with stroke feels, how a person with diabetes feels, and so on. So really, delve this instrument delve into the specificity and the nuances of different conditions. And you might ask, why don't we use them instead of the qualis? Why don't we use them instead of the Q5D? Because again, they're not going to be comparable across different health or disease areas. At the same time, uh, fortunately now we got we have we uh, we can have mapping a, a mechanism where we can map the scores from a specific uh, disease specific outcome measure into quality. So it's possible to use condition or disease specific outcome measure nowadays to to generate qualities. There are alternatives to qualities. Uh, so we can use, for example, other instruments, which uh, they're not uh, concerned so much about describing the health status of a person, but they are concerned about how a person is capable of being and doing. So I might have an health state, which is two, three, four, five, whatever, is really a descript an objective description of a, a personal status, but doesn't really consider how a person feels about doing certain things, about being uh, and, and so on. For example, the ice cap is another instrument which is based on five dimensions or attributes, stability, attachment, autonomy, achievement, enjoyment, which are quite different from the EQ5D dimensions. And they're trying to, they're trying to delve into other aspects which might be irrelevant, uh, might be relevant for people. An important, another important point is the externalities. With externalities, we mean any kind of spin-off effects that interventions have on other people other than the, the person receiving intervention. And we're talking about the interventions effects on caregivers here. So fortunately, nowadays, we can see more and more studies applying the Q5D to the patients, but also to caregivers to understand the quality of life. Uh, effects on the on the, on the caregivers as well. If you want to know more about the qualis, uh, Luis and I did this uh, vlog on qualis some time ago, and here you got the link uh, to that uh, uh, vlog. Discounting. Uh, so this is really to conclude the part about cost and outcomes, uh, and with discounting we are talking about uh, uh, how to value future costs, how to value future effects. And it's again a matter of opportunity cost. So you will probably see in your in your paper or in other papers that costs are usually accrued over a, a specific time period. So they'll be cost in year zero, year one, year two, and so on and so on. And at each time point, the decision maker might want to invest the money somewhere else because there are opportunity costs from investing that that a particular amount of money in uh, something else. So we need to consider this, this element, this element about opportunity cost and the, the possibility of, uh, of investing our money somewhere else uh, and potentially making a better use of our money. That's why we are, we are trying to, or economists and researchers in general, try to discount future cost and future effects. And with discounting, we are really trying to uh, consider that future cost and effects are valued less. Why? Again, there are theories attached to that, that, for example, people, as people, we are impatient. So we prefer to consume something now rather than later. There is some evidence maybe attached to that as well. At the same time, if you consider, for example, health effects or health gains, if you are in a particular poor health state now, any health gains will be very valuable right now. In one year time, you will feel healthier and you will still probably receive some health gains from the intervention, but those health gains in one year time, they're not going to be as valuable as they are now. In the same way that if I'm thirsty, the first glass of water will be very good for me. The 10th glass of water, yeah, maybe, maybe good, but not as good as the first one. So future cost and effect will be valued less. And this is the 
formula that people use to calculate uh, discounting uh, and 3.5% annual rate is the recommended discounting rate uh, uh, by the National Institute for Healthcare Excellence. Here I just provided with a couple of examples around discounting from a couple of papers uh, from team two and from team one and how the authors have considered or not considered discounting. So depending on, for example, the design of the analysis, discounting might not be uh, applied. Uh, for example, for team one paper, there was a really short time horizon. So discounting was not applied in that case. Right, homework for this session is again uh, to fill in another table, this time within from the outcome data and discounting. Uh, so we are going to ask you to complete this task by uh, Monday the 8th of July. And this is how you have uh, access to the to the homework document. As always, uh, the, you can access uh, Teams, uh, go on session for outcomes, and then you will, you will find the document with your name. And this is the table. And again, we are trying to provide you some information around the type of outcome data or the discounting that uh, information that you need to extract, try to provide some explanation about uh, what we would like uh, you to extract. And again, these might not all apply to you. So composite outcome, um, you know, there are, there are some papers which cover qualities, some others don't. So don't worry if you don't find information about qualities in your paper, that's fine. There will be some clinical outcomes, I guess, in all the papers or maybe most of the papers. And the same for discounting. You should be able to find some information about discounting if they've done this, if the authors have done discounting or maybe if they have not. And if you struggle, get back to us, please. And if you want some feedback, we are more than happy to give you feedback on, on your homework. And that's it for, for today. So this was our session four and then uh, two weeks time we'll have session five on results. Uh, and if you have any questions about today's sessions, um, we are, Misal and I are more than happy to stay here. And uh, of course, uh, we are going to talk a bit more about uh, the techniques to extrapolate the values uh, from, uh, to extract the values actually from the population uh, around the health states. But I'm going to stop the recording now and I just want to Thank you for attending today and thank you for all your questions around the, uh, the qualities before and how we extract values. And I hope to see you in two weeks time. Thank you, everyone.